We're going to transition now to talk about data cleaning, which I think is a super important topic. Um, it's often that we'll end up with some data that's not very easy to work with, and that's what we'll be discussing ways to fix that. So um, one of the most important roles about data science in general, data analytics, is that it's very important to thoroughly investigate and look at your data. Um, there will be surprising things that you will find in your data where someone has maybe entered in something incorrectly, or there's just weird patterns or features about your data. Um, so highly recommend that even when you think it's perfect, just take a, take a look uh, just in case. So we've talked a little bit about missing data, but we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that. Um, we previously talked about how you can do mathematical operations with summarization um, with Ava, um, where you can put the na.remove uh, to not include them in your mathematical operations. Um, but in general, there's a few ways we can have missing data. So there's the NA that we've seen. There's also NAN, which stands for not a number. Um, and we can have infinity and negative infinity. So generally all of these might cause issues for you and there's something to look out for. Um, the other thing is that sometimes they can be coded differently in the data that you receive from other programs or um, from your collaborators that might have a code. It may sometimes be a letter instead of a numeric um, that defines that it's missing. Um, so you can use the is NA for looking for NA uh, data, is NAN for NANs, is infinite for infinite, and that works for both positive and negative. Um, and there is finite, then meaning that it's not infinite. So there's a few uh, helpful commands for that. Um, we have talked before about how if you use the exclamation mark, that's basically equal to not. So that negates whatever you're trying to do. So if you're saying, if you're looking for is NAX, you're asking, are any of the elements of X NAs? And if that's true, that means that there, there's something that's NA. If we have not is NA, then we're asking, are all of the elements not NA? And so if the answer is false, that means, again, we have an NA value. There's some helpful uh, functions to investigate further. One is all and the other is any. So all is checking, are all the elements of X um, not an A in this case? And any would be, are there any elements within X that are NA? So you can see how those cases would be useful in different circumstances. So to walk through a few examples here, we have a vector that has one, two, four, and NA as one of its values, and a different vector called B, which does not have any NA values. So if we say, if we're trying to test, are any of the values of A um, NAs, by looking at it, we can see that the fourth element is NA. So we should get a value of true, which is indicating yes. However, if we look at B and we do the same thing, we're going to get no, there are not any values that are NA in B. So it can also be useful, and I think this is a, a very interpretable function um, to, to read the words out, uh, which is complete cases, which is basically asking are all the values of a row um, filled out? Are they complete? Are there no NA values? So the empty cars data set has 32 rows. Um, now we just learned what these numbers mean. So this is the 31st and this is the 32nd. 
and it's returning that for all of these rows, there are no missing data values. All of them are complete. All right, so those are useful, but what I think is especially useful is this package called Naniar. Um, I guess it's named after Narnia. So I'm not exactly sure how you're supposed to pronounce it, but something like that. Um, yeah, the people who develop packages ultimately can name them whatever they feel like. So in this case, they had a little bit of fun with it. Um, but it makes sense because the first part of it is like Nan. Um, and so if we were there in this package, there's a lot of really useful functions with, I think, very intuitive names to check about the missingness within your data. So for example, um, say we wanted, oops, there's a typo here, it should be lowercase. Uh, say we wanted to look at, use this package, we'd have to install it and load it just like we used to do with our other packages. This one is on CRANs, that's why we can do this. Um, and we say we have this vector x that has an na value. We can use this function pct complete, which stands for percent complete. And it will calculate the percent of the values that are complete. And we see that around 86% of x is complete. Um, another useful aspect, I think even more useful, particularly when you're working with really large data sets, like perhaps you're doing machine learning and you have a lot of different features, you have a lot of different variables. Um, it can be really helpful to know at a large scale how much missing data you have across your different variables or columns within your data, if you have like a data frame or a matrix. And so, in this case, we're looking at a data set that comes loaded with R. It's called Iris. You'll see it in a lot of tutorials for R. <clears throat> it has to do with information about flowers that are irises. And here we're using a function called ggmissver. So it's asking to create a plot. You'll see in a second that um, you know, you'll see later today that or or tomorrow about the grammar of graphics. And so that's what the GG stands for. It's indicating that we're making a plot and missing for miss and ver for variable. So how much of our variables are missing? And in this case, um, none of our variables are missing any data. So you can see that they're all plotted on this x-axis of um, proportion missing that there, there isn't or there aren't any values that are missing across all of our variables. Okay, so um, why does this matter? We saw a little bit earlier about how when we're using summarize that that can cause a problem if we have missing data, but this is also true for logicals. So remember logicals tell us if something is true or false. Uh, we learned that yesterday with Marta in our classes lecture. And so if we were to ask something like, okay, we have this vector X still and we wanna know if the values are greater than two, um, we'll receive values that are true or false about whether each element is greater than two. And as you can see for N, uh, NA, we receive a value of NA. And this is actually a good thing because we don't know what NA stands for. It could be data that is uh, greater than two or less than two or something completely unrelated. Um, so it's good that, that our automatically does this, but sometimes that's not um, what we want to do. Um, so filter, as we know, is a very useful function, but something to keep in mind about it is that it will actually remove missing values by default, and that can be problematic. So for example, working back again with this same vector, um, we're going to now ask, are any of the values within this vector uh, zero or two? So we're using our in percent in um, operator to ask if they're in the set of zero or two. And here we get 
true for zero, false for NA, and um, true for two here. So that looks pretty good, but actually we can have problems. It looks like this didn't print quite as I exactly wanted it to, but <laughs> it's a good idea sometimes to make sure you have is or is NA X if you're trying to keep um, your, your NA values here. Um, this is a bit confusing in this output here uh, because we have a true value, but if we wanted to later look for our NA values, this is important uh, to keep because remember, we don't know if our NA actually is in the set of zero or two, or if it's something completely unrelated. So it depends on what your purpose is. The point is to be careful whenever you have NA values and recheck what your operations are doing even if they're logical. So it doesn't matter if they're just mathematical. Okay, so the drop NA function of the tidyr package is particularly useful if you just want to remove basically uh, all of your NA values. However, it's very aggressive. So it's important to remember that this function will drop all rows with any missing data in any column. So if we create a tibble like this, this is how we make a tibble. We can define x. Now we know a little bit more based on Marta's lecture. We can define a column named x and a column named y. And in here, we have a list of values. And we can see that there's three NA values. So when we look at our tibble, we see in the first row, we have an NA for column two. In the second row, we have an NA for column one. and then our fourth column, we also have an NA value. If we do drop NA on this data frame, we will be left with only the third row. But sometimes that's what you want, so it's very useful for that. Um, you can, however, do drop NA for a particular column if you specify. All right, um, so the other thing is we covered yesterday tabulation. Um, and missing data can also make this a bit tricky. So there's just a couple of aspects that I wanted to go over when we're using table. You can use this argument use NA and you can specify if you want to do if any or always. And this will define whether we are going to see an NA column in our table that will specify if we have NA values. So we will get this column, our, our information about our NA values, if we use if any, only if there are NA values. So in our case, we have a vector called Z, and we don't have any NA values. So we, when we use if any, we're not going to see an NA column here. However, if we use always, we're asking for R to always report if there are any NA values, even if there aren't any. And so we can see here we have zero listed for NA. So if you forget this, you can always use the question mark table um, or to see more information about how this uh, function works. Okay. All right, and that brings us to the first part of our lab. Now for something that I think is really important, uh, recoding variables. So this can be really useful if you have inconsistent uh, data entry, which happens quite often. So for example, you have a data set where um, maybe your collaborator, maybe it was you, uh, has included, for example, gender as male, M, capital M, lowercase m, all these different forms and you know trying to keep that trying to get information from a table for example about how many males are included in your data set would be quite difficult because you'd have to sum across all of these different versions of what um, male means and so in this case it would be nice to recode all of these different versions into one 
um, to keep things simple and to allow you to do certain operations. So there's a nifty function called recode, which is quite intuitive. I think it's a, a nice name. Um, to use this, you'll need to use generally the mutate function if you're working within a data frame. And so we would be taking, for example, a data set and we have within this data a column called gender and we want to mutate or change that column um, by recoding that column uh, to indicate what we want the current values uh, to be. And so in this case, we want to take our, our capital M, our lowercase m, and man, and we want to make them all male. And we might already have male in the data, and that's fine. We can leave it as is. You could also use the if else function or case when, but um, we're not going to cover that. But if you, if you uh, feel like checking that out and testing out how we might do that, um, that could be an exercise that would be useful. Um, the other thing that's really helpful is separating columns. So sometimes you will have, in this case, we're showing a vector uh, and I'll go through that in a second, but this would be a useful thing to do if, for example, you had, I think yesterday in one of the breakout groups, someone was saying that they had, um, you know, data, if you have multiple pieces of data in a single column, uh, that can be, make it difficult to perform certain operations when you want to know about each aspect within that column. So you can separate that into multiple columns. So here we're, in this example, we're creating a tibble, um, which is, has a variable called x and within it is a vector of these character strings. And we want to separate them into uh, different columns that will be first, second, and third. So we're gonna use the separate function. Um, we describe which, which aspect of our tibble and we wanna separate into these three pieces and we wanna name those pieces. So um, here we get three different columns and we have I really, and it creates an NA value for the third piece because we don't really have a third piece here. It's automatically here recognizing that we have spaces in between our, um, our elements of character strings, but you can specify how you want to separate. Um, and you could, for example, separate by something that might not seem as obvious to R. Typically, R will, by default, figure out what you're trying to do, um, but sometimes it doesn't, and you'll need to specify with a sep equals uh, argument, uh, which will become clear in a bit. But in general, this is a, a very useful uh, function for creating new columns out of columns that already exist. Uh, and I think this will be more clear in the lab when we're working with um, a data frame. So here you see the separate argument that I was talking about. So you could specify, for example, that actually you want to separate by the letter R and that would um, actually remove the R's and it would look fairly similar, but a little bit different from what we have here. Uh, clearly in this, in this third row, we'd have a few more R's than the others. So you can try testing something like that out. Um, but the useful thing here is adding this extra merge argument uh, helps us to ensure that we don't lose any of our extra um, NA values for spaces where we didn't have another piece. Um, again, I think that the lab will, will make this more clear. And then 
for uniting columns, uh, there are cases, and I do remember also that this was something that someone had a, a case in our breakout room when we were talking about dates where they had day and month and year across different columns and they wanted to make it a date variable and use the Louvre date package. And they could do that by first uniting those three columns into one. And so um, to be able to do that, they could use what's called the unite function. So here we're gonna start out with an example data frame. Here we have created a tibble where we have uh, two variables, ID and visit. So here you see them, ID and visit. And we'd like to combine these two columns into one. And so we're gonna use our unite function and we're gonna specify a new name for the column that we're creating. So we use the call equals argument to create this new name and we're gonna name it unique ID. And then we specify the columns that we're combining. And in this case, it's ID and visit. And we specify with the same argument set equals that we saw in the separate function. And we're going to specify that we want to use an underscore. So when we recreate data frame, create a new data frame called data frame united, we can see that we now have underscores um, between the two values of our two columns. And we now only have a single column. So we have united those two columns. And you can see now, if you wanted to separate this again, you could use separate the separate function and specify the unique ID um, column and specify that you wanted to separate based on um, this underscore. Again, you can also let R try and it would probably uh, separate based on the underscore automatically. But it is probably generally better practice to specify what you're separating by because um, you never know how, how it might work on a very large data set. Um, it might look good at the top of the data frame, but maybe down below there's some strange things happening. I'm just going to check the chat with the faculty. Looks like we're OK. All right, and then we're going to touch very briefly on string functions. So um, this is, I think, a very, very useful thing to know about if you work with a lot of character string data. Um, so if you do text mining and that sort of thing, it's, it's useful. There's also some other suites of packages related to text mining in general, but Stringer is um, a package that we're going to be using to look at a whole, uh, to look at pieces within our character strings as opposed to just the entire string that we've already been using. So a stringer package, package is spelled like this, uh, like string and R. And if you are familiar with other uh, programming languages uh, or base R, you might be familiar with a function called grep and g sub, which is helpful for finding uh, aspects of your files or your code. And um, so Stringer is helpful for this sort of thing. Uh, and it has basically equivalent functions that we're going to go over. Uh, but all of the functions start with str and an underscore. And we're going to go over a few of them, but I recommend if you're really interested in working with strings that you check out the stringer package because there are many, many, many functions that are very useful. Also, I have posted an open case studies link on our resources on the website. And there are a couple of case studies that go very, very in depth on how to work with this. This is particularly useful if you're importing PDF files. Um, so if you happen to have data that you need to use from a report or something, uh, then it can be really useful to be able to work with strings. Okay, so if we have tidyverse installed and we want to load library stringer um, or we installed stringer separately, um, we would load it as typical. And then here we have created 
a single string here that's I really like writing R code, which hopefully is true for your class. <laughs> um, and assigned it to X. And um, say we wanted to split this up, we could we could do things like assigning it separately in a vector like this um, to our data frame. Or we could just use simply the str split function and say that we want to work with x, which is where we have it all together, and that we want to split by spaces. So this will create a list. And we just went over with Marta what a list is. To make it easier to see, we can use the unlist function. And here now we have um, a vector essentially of our elements, which are each of the character strings separated out from the initial character string into um, different words. And so now the length of y is six, whereas the length of x, if we checked it, would be one. Um, and you can see where this might be useful. OK, so some of you might be familiar with something called a regular expression or regex, sometimes they're called. So if you're not familiar with that term, that's OK. We're going to discuss it together. Uh, but you can also check out or Google what a regular expression is. But basically, these are special characters that don't mean um, what they are based on what they are in writing. So for example, a period doesn't necessarily just mean period. It means that's also a wild card and it could match any character. So um, we've seen this in R because we know that the equal sign is used to assign variables. So it doesn't mean equals um, per se. And we know that the um, money sign can be used to, um, or the dollar sign, that's a regional thing, it's weird, um, <laughs> can be used to specify that we're trying to pull out a column within our data frame. But it can also mean that we're talking about the end of a uh, vector. So there are different meanings in different times for these different um, uh, values. And so that's that can get a little bit confusing and a lot of people struggle, struggle with uh, regular expressions. So I just want to touch on the fact that these exist and we'll just do a couple of examples uh, working with them. But if you end up having some of these characters in your data, it can make it a bit more challenging to, um, to split with it and, or to um, work with your character strings, but we'll, we'll go through some simple examples. Um, there are also cases where it can be useful for, for describing parts of your strings, like the beginning of your string can be um, used. You can say that I'm looking for strings that start with A, for example, or that end with B. Um, and so they can be they can be very helpful, but also challenging. So just um, take your time with it. So Stringer makes this a bit easier by giving us a modifier called fixed. And for that, if we want to use, for example, period, and we want to split by period, and we don't want it to be a wild card, we want it to actually just mean period, then we can just say fixed equals true. So match it exactly. Don't interpret this special character as its special character, meaning interpret it as its normal meaning. Um, so that makes it a lot help, easier. The ignore case uh, modifier, it does what you might expect. Um, it helps you to ignore whether there's capitalization within your strings. So that can be useful. So we're going to go through now some very simple examples with a regex, um, a regular expression. 
So right now we have a, a vector here. Um, we have I like strings separated by periods and we wanna split this into different words. So if we try to split by the period using str split, which is the function that helps us split strings, then we're going to get output that we don't want. And this is happening because it's interpreting the period as a wild card. So it counts any single element here in our character string as a period. So I is worthy of being considered a period. Period is uh, L, etc. So we don't want that. Um, and we can just do fixed, like we said, as the modifier to make str split split across the string uh, where we have our periods. We can also use, this is the more common version, and this is what you would have to use in functions outside of Stringer, um, which is to escape the special version of period and only use the normal version of what period means. And so here this gets the same output as using fixed. So other functions in Stringer that are especially useful, again, there's um, maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them. There's a lot of functions, but uh, two that are particularly useful and kind of equivalent to grep, if you're familiar with that, and gsub are str detect and str replace. So detect is looking for uh, patterns that match uh, the character that you're asking to look for and replace looks for a pattern and changes it to whatever replacement you have specified. So we're going to show some simple data or not simple data, but some simple <laughs> examples using some data. And this is kind of interesting if you're interested in Baltimore city uh, government if you're living in Baltimore, I know many of you are not, so this will not be as interesting to you, but you might find similar data for wherever you're living. Um, so we're going to read in some salary data for uh, the Baltimore government employees. And so say we're interested in the last name Rawlings because we are curious how much our mayor was making at the time, then we could use str detect to look for that name within the data set. So in this case, we're starting with the salary data set and we're asking to filter that data by matches in the variable name. So here's our name variable that match the name Rawlings. And so here you can see that there's three people on the salary list that have the last name Rawlings. Um, and here we can see our, the mayor and how much their salary was. Kind of crazy what you can find on the internet. Um, okay, so there's also a couple of variants of this. So there's str replace and str replace all. So str replace um, is our like I said, we're, we're not just detecting, but we're going to change out the value. And there are two versions. The first one will only replace the first instance and the second one will replace all instances. So we're gonna walk through this. So um, this is a typo, this should be lowercase n. I apologize for that, but this, um, I was trying to update things late last night. Um, <laughs> so here we're going to replace A's with J's. And so if we do that for the first instance, in the initial version, there this would say Aaron, A-A-R-O-N. Um, but here they have gotten replaced. The first A's that we see are replaced with J's. Um, this is lowercase a. This is why the capital A is not changed. So this is, if we had included ignore case, then capital A would have been replaced. But in this case, 
Stringer by default is going to pay attention to the case of the characters. And so here we're replacing, we're just looking at the two here is looking at the head. We want to know the first two values. So that's all that is, but we're using the STR replace on the particular variable name of the salary data set. And we're replacing A's with J's. And so you can see that Patricia here has two other A's that aren't replaced in this particular value. And in Petra, we also have another A also not replaced. But if we use STR replace all, then in each particular value of the name column of our salary data, all A's that are lowercase again will be replaced with a J. So that's how that works. And then just one last piece of um, information for working with strings that can be really useful is the paste and paste zero functions. And these are helpful for joining strings together. So in this case, we are creating the strings that we're working with. We, we want to use visit and we want to have five visit um, elements and we want to have an underscore in between. So we are pasting the word visit to each element within one through five and separating them with an underscore, which gives us this output. But say, for example, we want that to give us a single output, we can use um, a collapse argument and specify how we want to collapse it. So you could collapse this with nothing and it would actually just squish it all together. But in this case, we specified um, an underscore. You would still need to put quotes though around nothing if you do that. <laughs> you can try that in a second um, in our lab. But here you can see now we have one single element here of all the visits combined into a giant string. The paste zero function is really useful because um, often we don't want anything in between. Uh, and for that, you can kind of skip this step. Um, it's kind of like I was describing with the collapse where you would have nothing as your separator. Instead of specifying that paste zero automatically puts nothing in between the two things that you're combining. Um, However, in general, it's useful to have something between elements like this, because if you want to separate it out later using the separate function, it's a lot easier to do that if you already have a, a character that's being used to separate those elements. Okay, and so now we are ready for the second part of our data cleaning lab.